So Lucy, this is the uh, second year that we've reviewed management and what's happened. I think we're now entitled to call this an annual review. I hope so, yeah. So what, what for you has been the biggest theme of uh, 2015? Well, by far the biggest one has been absolutely brilliant. It's been the axing of the annual performance review. Um, we've had GE, Accenture and Deloitte have all recognised what should have been perfectly obvious to everyone a million years ago, that waiting till the end of the year to tell someone how they're doing and then doing that in a very clumsy way is the most pathetic way of managing anyone. So they've all axed it and everyone else has got to follow, don't you think? Well, I've just been told I'm having an annual review, aren't you? <laughs> Actually, I'm so <laughs> obstructive during mine, I think I generally get forgotten about because everybody knows how much I hate it. But I very much hope that um, now the FT has new owners that we will no longer have to go through it because, I mean, it makes no sense. And when everything's meant to be instantaneous, to tell people after a year whether they're doing a good or bad job when no one can even remember whether they've done a good or bad job is about the worst way of appraising anyone ever invented. I mean, I think Deloitte worked out it was costing them two million quid a year to um, tell people things that were of no use to them. So that's no loss. Anyway, I think that's just brilliant. Really, It's very unusual that at the end of the year you can look back and say something fantastic has happened, but this time it really, really has. So you just celebrated your 30th anniversary at the FT. I, I am a mere novice with only 29 yeah. years. Oh. What, what do I need to know about that 30th year? Well, I had planned not to write about it at all because it was just too shaming. But then because, you know, the need for column ideas is so great, I decided to ask all of our colleagues what 30 years meant to them. And because all of our colleagues are generally a horrid bunch, um, they wrote back saying it means that either you're very unimaginative or or very risk averse and the more I thought about that the more indignant I got and I thought hang on you know if you've been married for 30 years no one says oh you're really risk averse or you're not very ambitious and so I sort of thought actually that isn't right and if you've done 30 years I think it means that I've chosen actively to stay with the FT for 30 years and they've chosen actively not to fire me so I think that there's something to celebrate in that one. What about you? How are you going to feel next year, do you think? Well, I don't know. I suppose the main feeling, overwhelming feeling I have about having worked for the FT this long is that I've been extraordinarily lucky. And I suppose that, that, that chimes very much with this idea of I'm about to screw up. And I think, well, yeah. I've kept going this long. Uh, and I suppose it comes to the point, you may remember last year when we finished, my theme was I was talking about Carlos Slim and how he had put some of his, uh, suggested to some of his older workers that they go down to working three days a week. And I suggested this was going to be a big trend. In fact, what seems to be in a bigger trend is people saying how much they like retiring. Which you've just written about. I wrote about. And that makes me think you're about to retire, Mike, because you say how marvellous retirement is. I jolly well hope that's not true. Well, I don't think I'm about to retire just yet, but it made me think about it because the reason I wrote about it. We've had quite a few retirement parties recently and I was very struck by our retired colleagues coming back and noticing how healthy they all looked. They were all kind of had this glow which I suspect is from gardening and hiking and they all seemed very happy and none of them seemed to be bored. They and they've all, all lost weight inexplicably. They've all lost weight. Yeah well that's not that inexplicable. They're not sitting at a desk all the mm. time. They're moving around a lot more but they were all very busy. I mean retirement for them wasn't sort of you know sitting gazing at the sunset which given our climate's probably a very fortunate thing. So um, I started to think, well, maybe it's not the end of the world when this comes to an end, although, as you point out, I'm not quite ready for it. Yet. Yeah. Although, actually, a lot of the people commenting on that were saying, I retired and have never been more miserable and I'd love to get straight back to work. Is one meant to pity those? Or Yeah, I think looking at the comments, there were many more happy retirees, if that's the horrible word, but than unhappy ones. So mm -hmm. I think there's some truth to that. So before you retire, Mike, you can possibly produce some more columns like the one about VW and trust. That was really brilliant, pointing out that it's not the first time that we've lost trust in companies and we get it back much, much more quickly than anyone thought. Yes, I have to say, having said that, people, we do get trust back quickly. I do find the VW scandal quite extraordinary. 
Um, the first scandal I ever wrote about was the Guinness scandal, which God, happened just about when, yeah. when we started at the FT. And there have been many since. But the VW scandal strikes me as, as different because the others were scandals where people kind of drifted into bad behavior. Mm. You know, in the financial mm. world, people were doing something which came to be regarded as more or less acceptable, mm. and they just pushed and pushed and pushed a bit further. What is so striking about the VW case is the outright deception. Somebody decided we're going to put the software in these diesel cars, which can sense when the pollution environmental authorities are testing the car, and it will basically reduce the emissions. But what do you think happens to levels of trust after that? They go down. Yeah, obviously. Uh, VW, VW sales went down immediately but after this. How long does it take for them to come back? It and doesn't. do they ever come back? Oh, no, they do come back. See, exactly. Yeah. They do come back. Now, what a, a, a particular one reader wrote in and said, I, I talked, for example, you may remember a few years ago, there was a huge sort of, uh, there was a huge E. coli scandal mm. in Europe and yeah. in the UK. And also there was the, the horse meat in beef scandal. And no one talks about that anymore. Nobody, no oh, at the time, this. people said, yeah. oh, no one will ever yeah. eat beef again. But of course, people forget about it. And what this reader said is that's because we actually live in Western Europe and the US, North America, we live in well-ordered societies. Mm. And actually people have got quite a lot of trust in the regulatory system. Uh, what this reader said is if you lived in China, you wouldn't be so, um, you wouldn't be so nonchalant about uh, the beef business because you would be worried that all your food mm. was bad. We have got a lot of trust in our whole system. Yes, but couldn't you also play it the other way and say that we have very little trust in companies? So we're not that surprised when they do something wrong and so long as it doesn't actually hurt us directly we kind of are slightly cynical and shrug and if it's still in our interests to go on buying their products we still do and so this idea that companies say that they've got to have this very tight bond of trust with consumers is sort of self-serving and quasi-religious no I think um, that's true The other big issue this year, from my point of view, was travel and business travel. And this really is something that our readers... You did quite a lot of it yourself. I did a lot of it myself this year. Um, but our readers get very excited about this. And I, I've written about various, various issues. The one which got people really exercised was when I objected to... I mean, these really are first world problems, if you think of the circumstances under which many people in the world are living. But I talked about hotels that charge you for Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, our readers <laughs> went mad. But Probably. that does just show you, I mean, I know one shouldn't really slag off one's readers at this sort of thing, but the more trivial the issue, the more Financial Times readers seem to love it. Possibly. I am very exercised <laughs> by these Wi-Fi charges, even though I can pass them on to my company, as most people can. Uh, so that was one thing. The other thing was when British Airways made it harder for people to get air miles if they travelled the economy. That also got yeah, people all really, really good. Please. As I pointed out at the time, and I'm a collector of air miles as I've travelled a lot this year, um, listen to what they're telling you. You know, air miles are not a reward for loyalty. Air miles are there to distort your behaviour. All loyalty schemes are there to distort your behavior and if you don't like it well fly with a cheaper airline so that was one the other one that got people very excited was uh, there was a there was a, a consultancy study about the hotel room of the future which is all about technology and the online experience and all this sort of thing and I, I wrote in this one and the readers really agreed with this actually we just didn't need that what we needed in hotels were better reading lights yeah. better desks because most of these desks are too high you can't actually mm. work on them and, and that sort of thing it raises the question, why do people travel at all for business? I mean, um, obsessing about the height of the desk and, and, and the reading lamp is all very well, but it's not actually the point of it. No, that's true. Um, I've often wondered whether all of these trips are strictly necessary or whether people go on them just because it's a lot nicer than staying at home. Well, I think there's a lot to that, and that is what got our readers most exercised of all, was when I said, after all these columns, I said, you know, we moan about business travel, exactly as you said, the height of the desk. We moan about how awful it is. And we, I think we really do this to persuade the people in the office who stay behind and who don't get to travel that we're having a horrible time. What I said in this column is I actually feel very, very privileged to be allowed to travel on business. I've gone all over the world at someone else's expense. And I said, I thought this was absolutely marvelous. And this really, really split Financial Times readers. A few, and it's quite interesting, they thought they'd better email me directly to say, well done, it's about time somebody said that. Now, 
the, the other issue that, uh, that you wrote about was uh, the question, we've actually disagreed about this quite often, should you force people to be in the office or not? Oh, yes. Now this, I hope, will be my trend for next year, that the office is going to stage a comeback. I mean, the office has been really resistant to change. I mean, I know we're all supposed to be working flexibly and all of that. But the reason, if you get on the train in the morning, it's crowded, people are coming to work. The reason for that is that offices work. It's so important to see people. I mean, I, I wrote, my trend of last year was that employers would help us get off our gadgets. And that has been a disaster, but it's as needed. I mean, it's been a disaster as a trend because that hasn't happened but it's as needed as ever because work has spun out over our lives and what we need to do is to do work in the office with each other. Um, and I mean, I wrote about some friends of, of mine who have been working from home and they've sort of, they don't like their jobs anymore because they don't see their colleagues often enough. Well, I suppose this is one of the things when I talk to these happy, healthy people who'd retired and I asked them, is there anything you miss? They said, yeah, I miss the gossip. Yeah, and you can't have the gossip on Skype or email. So what I hope in 2016 is that people will get out of their slippers and pyjamas, come into the office, talk to each other, get their work done, have a gossip, and then by 5 or 5.30, go home again.